Okay, welcome everyone to our On the Pulse series. Glad that you made the time to join us today. My name is Christine Fortman and I am the CEO of the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation and we are thrilled that you decided to do some distance learning with us today. So before I turn it over to our keynote, I would like to give you a little background on the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. Our mission is to improve cardio cardiovascular health through innovative research and education. And you can see that in the circles on the slide, that by doing this research, by providing this education, it is our goal to improve your care. So we are able to do this as an independent nonprofit organization, although we partner with the Minneapolis Heart Institute, with Abbott Northwestern Hospital, and Alina Health, we are an independent organization. We have about 80 staff with 200 active studies happening that touch the lives of over 2,000 patients. Nothing says it better than some pictures. So here under research, you see some of the great team members that are often doing first in human or first in the world research. And we do research across the spectrum, everywhere from prevention to heart failure, which you'll hear more about today. The other side of our mission is education, and we are dedicated to educating the next generation of healthcare providers. And here in this picture, you see some of our interns. So we have a fantastic internship program where pre-med students are paired with a physician and help that physician with their physician-initiated research. In addition to that, we provide continuing medical education through our grand rounds and other um, presentations, and our physicians are dedicated to publishing their research, which results in over 200 peer review manuscripts annually. Again, we love our pictures. So you can see here, under hope and inspiration, a lot of our patients who have benefited from the research happening here. And in addition to providing education to our practitioners, we like to get out into the community as we are today doing so virtually with you. It is our goal that the research that happens here is spread nationally and internationally and improves protocols and care overall. So how do we do this work? A lot of it happens because of gracious, generous donors. Um, half of our work is funded philanthropically and the other half is through industry-sponsored clinical trials. So I always like to take a minute to thank all of you who are current supporters and if you'd like to find out more about partnering with the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation, at the end you'll have more contact information. So we have been in the news lately. We are usually just more general cardiovascular health, but of late it's been around COVID-19. If you visit our website, you can learn more about the important research that's happening specifically in that area. We have a tiger team of our research team members that are also nurses who are over on the front line in the clinic helping with emergency clinical trials at this time. And also we want to invite you to go to our website where we've interviewed some of our physicians and we have some wellness tips during this COVID-19 time. Also, you can always share a word of gratitude. We know that is good for our hearts and we are building a, a library of gratitude there. So please take a minute to check it out. So now I would like to ask Scott Sharkey to come forward. Dr. Sharkey is the Chief Medical Officer and President of the Foundation and a clinical researcher also, and he will introduce our keynote. Thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. And uh, uh, we're uh, here at the Abbott Northwestern Hospital campus in the, in the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation building. This is our new broadcasting center. I wish we could see each and every one of you in person, uh, but, and I want to send you our greetings and that our, our concern for your health. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker, um, my partner, friend, and colleague, uh, Dr. Peter Ekman. He's the director of our heart failure section here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute, and he is a one of our um, more productive researchers at the, uh, in, at the uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. Peter received his um, medical degree from the University of Minnesota, and his um, 
cardiology fellowship training also from the University of Minnesota, and his advanced heart failure treatment, it, treatment, <laughs> his advanced heart failure, pardon me, <coughs> his advanced heart failure education from the Cleveland Clinic. Now, when Peter was a fellow many years ago, I remember working with him and immediately being impressed with his intellect and his uh, bedside manner. And I told him, I said, Peter, someday you're going to have to come and work for us. And so we recruited him away from a leading institution here uh, a few years ago. And I'm proud to say that Peter is now um, uh, proud to be one of our partners. So um, before I have him come up here, I'm going to tell you his, um, his motto that he has, or his mission that he has shared with us. And I'm going to quote, as a cardiologist, I am honored to have the opportunity to help patients feel better and live longer. I make it my priority to provide outstanding care and work hard to be accessible, thorough, honest, patient, and easy to understand. And I will include your other doctors in your care plan, and I respect each patient and their decision. So I, I think that's a great uh, opportunity for us to have Peter come up and share with um, you all his talk today on heart failure research and clinical applications. Peter? Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you to all for joining us. Um, I'm guessing by the fact that you signed up to join us today that many, if not most, of you have a pretty good sense of what heart failure is, although I'll just say briefly, um, we probably need a better term for it, but it's pretty well ingrained in the medical literature at this point, so it'd be tough, uh, a tough sell for me to completely change the name. <laughs> but we usually refer to it as um, a treatment that, uh, or a condition where the heart is either not squeezing well or it doesn't relax well. And so this implies that the circulation is not ideal. It's often a result of heart attacks or valve disease. And so I often describe this as the final common pathway of many cardiovascular problems. Um, it's one of the uh, biggest medical problems in the country, and it's the number one reason that people are hospitalized in the United States. And so it's a, I, I'm in no danger of being out of work anytime soon um, because it's such a common problem. I wanted to talk today a little bit about some of the relatively newer treatments that are coming out, some of the clinical trials and things that are really changing the landscape of care for heart failure. In general, um, we use everything from stents to pacemakers to surgery to pills um, to treat people's uh, heart failure, uh, but there's some new treatments that I wanted to talk a little bit about today. Um, in terms of disclosures, um, I have worked as a consultant for Abbott, the, the company, not the hospital, although I work at the hospital too, and Medtronic, um, and also a company called Daxor. I won't be talking about any Daxor-specific uh, products today, but Abbott and Medtronic both have a number of products in the cardiovascular space. Um, any uh, uh, financial remuneration from these activities is directed to the foundation where Scott and Chris are in charge of what we do with the money, so I don't get to spend it once we bring it in. So this is a, a sculpture that I found uh, in a museum several years ago. And one of the things I liked about it, if I can get the laser to work here, is this is an example of, uh-oh. I clicked a button I shouldn't have. It's okay. okay. I'm going to wait for my tech support here. <laughs> there we go. So I think, hopefully, you can see the arrow. How do, I, how do I get the laser live again? And then I would just make sure that the microphone up there isn't rubbing on your jacket. can't use a typical laser pointer because it's on a screen, so it just gets lost. Thank you. So you can see here, this is a, a famous sculpture. And here's the st uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, 
Often patients ask me, why are you looking at my neck? What are you looking at? And a lot of that is because looking at the veins in someone's neck is one of the ways that we can tell if someone has congestion. And you often may hear of heart failure referred to as congestive heart failure. That refers to fluid retention. And so really, we're looking at the veins that are in this sort of triangular area. And here's an example of a patient who has heart failure. You can see his external vein here as that's distended due to extra fluid or extra congestion. Um, this also can manifest as swelling in the abdomen or in the ankles or some common places. But this is one of the ways that we assess whether or not someone's heart failure is well treated or if they need more intense treatment. As I said, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the new medications, some of what's evolving with monitoring for patients with heart failure to try to help keep them well. There's been some interesting developments with what we call structural heart modifications, and then a little bit about some new uh, developments in the transplant space. So as I said earlier, there's two large types of heart failure, one where the heart doesn't squeeze well, which is called reduced ejection fraction heart failure or systolic heart failure. There's another kind where the heart doesn't relax well. We have more data and better information on the reduced ejection fraction or the type of heart failure where the heart doesn't squeeze well. And there's really three different hormone pathways that the body has that our medications are designed to block these. And that's the mainstay of treatment for heart failure right now. And I won't get into the specifics of those medications. Um, these pathways are very well established. But what has happened recently is that there's a fourth pathway that we've learned and have had um, development of a new type of medication or, or a new class of medication that's designed to treat heart failure. And I need to rewind a little bit to tell you the story about this because it's, I think, an interesting story. Um, historically, um, you know, diabetes has been well recognized for decades as being a major contributor to risk of heart disease. And historically, if a drug company invented a medication to treat diabetes, all they had to do was show that it lowered blood sugar. Well, uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, there was a class of medications that lowered blood sugar, but retrospective analysis showed that it actually increased the risk of heart disease. So then the FDA said, all right, drug companies, now if you're going to invent a diabetes drug, you have to at least prove that it doesn't make people's hearts worse uh, if you're going to be able to market it as a safe and effective product. And so as a result of this, a new class of medications called SGLT2 inhibitors, which I won't bore you with the details of what all that stands for, but the crux of it is these are medications that block reabsorption of glucose and cause excretion uh, or loss of more glucose or sugar in the urine. So it's another way to treat diabetes. There are other mechanisms molecularly of how this works, but that's beyond the scope of what I wanted to get into today. What was discovered was that this medication or this class of medications actually reduced many cardiovascular complications. And the community between uh, researchers and the manufacturing companies decided to pursue trials of well, if this reduces cardiovascular complications, maybe it works even in people without diabetes. And so a trial called the DAPA heart failure trial was published uh, in late uh, September of last year. And I would say this has been one of the most notable heart failure trials in the last uh, several years, certainly. The reason for that was that this was taking a drug invented for diabetes and testing it in people who had heart failure but not diabetes because initial indications showed that this helped people with heart failure and diabetes uh, substantially. Now, of note, the other medications that we use to treat heart failure, um, most of those were also not invented for the purpose of heart failure. And so in a sense, a lot of the treatment history of heart failure has been one of serendipity and repurposing drugs that were invented for other purposes. Um, now, and I, I promise there aren't too many technical slides here, but this is an example showing the benefits of this specific uh, medication that was tested in heart failure patients with low squeezing um, without diabetes or half with, half without, I should say. So on the x-axis here, this is the time since the study started. On the y-axis, it's how many people have had a specific event. For this trial, it was cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, or urgent heart failure visit, meaning you're short of breath, you come to the emergency room on an urgent basis. Um, as these events accumulate, the curves go up. And as you might imagine, the faster the curve goes up, the more events there are. So in the placebo or sugar pill group, the curve went up faster than patients that were treated with this, this particular diabetes medication called dapagliflozin. This was a 
very significant difference um, and clearly was a, a setting a marker down as this being a new class of medication used to treat heart failure. Um, what's particularly notable, and we didn't plan this, of course, when we planned this presentation, was that literally two days ago, the FDA, as a result of this trial, has now present, uh, accepted an indication of this medication to use for heart failure. And what that means is that the company that makes this medication can now market it and say, we have this drug that we recommend you use for heart failure. We have safety and efficacy data on that point. Before this, we as physicians have been free to use this medication, even uh, though it was not officially indicated for this purpose. It's referred to as off-label prescribing, which is actually very common in medicine, where we as physicians use our discretion to take medications that may have been approved for another purpose, and if we think there's reason to believe they would be effective, use them for this problem. Now, what I want to highlight here is this is an example of an analysis done by uh, Greg Fonero at UCLA, who's a well-known heart failure cardiologist, showing the benefit of these multiple types of medications. And you may remember I had the slide with the three different classes of medications. And so for someone with a low ejection fraction on no medications, we would expect in two years, one in three of those patients would be dead. This is a rate of death higher than many types of cancer. And so heart failure is in many cases a mortal diagnosis. It's a very high risk of progression. What's notable though is by adding these three, and now this fourth class of medications, we can decrease the risk of dying from one in three at two years to one in 10. Now this does require a number of medications to achieve this, and it often is a matter not only of being on these types of medications, but being on the right doses of them. And so this is uh, yet another arrow in the quiver, so to speak, of how we can uh, treat patients with heart failure. Um, from this registry, one of the things we also see um, this just highlights what percentage of people are on each of these different classes of medications. And this slide was made before this new class was essentially approved for this. Um, it shows that although a pretty high fraction of people are on these medications, um, that you can see the, the maroon bars show anywhere from 30% uh, to 70%, and one of the classes is, is pretty low. Um, the green bars show what percent are on the target or the goal dose. And I think it's very clear from this that we have a lot of opportunity to optimize medical treatment of heart failure and that there's a lot of people that have potential to have better outcomes with more of these medications. Um, as another example, this was actually just published online yesterday, um, also by uh, Dr. Fonero and, and Clyde Yancey, who's a cardiologist from Northwestern in Chicago. They estimated that there's about 3.1 million patients who have this type of problem almost 70% are candidates for this new class of medications. And if we were to implement this in all the people for whom it was indicated, we would prevent between 21,000 and 50,000 deaths per year. So because this is such a common problem, we really have a tremendous opportunity to improve the care of people with heart failure. Now, one of the challenges of this, I always like to tell the story that many of you may have heard of the limes, where it was discovered that limes prevented scurvy but from the time that decision or that uh, discovery was made until the limes were a standard part of being on the ships, not just for the pirates, but for the navies of the world, um, took quite a while, decades and in some cases centuries. And so one of the things that is a challenge in, in medicine is that although we have advancing science all the time, how do we implement what we know and how do we make sure that we're delivering the type of care and the right care to the right people? Um, and so I want to pivot a little bit to talk about a project that I've worked on with uh, Dr. Bradley, uh, who's one of my partners here, looking at uh, not just how do we get the right medications to the right patients, but how do we make sure that people are getting the other treatments that they're indicated for. As a practice, we're following about 10,000 patients with this reduced ejection fraction. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of opportunities, even uh, beyond the one-on-one -on -one interactions, where we do our best to provide the best care for every patient at every visit. We were able to use our electronic medical record, and this is something that's becoming easier to do over time, to screen people based on echocardiograms, or ultrasounds of the heart, and EKGs, to identify people that may benefit from a particular type of pacemaker, but don't already have one. Now, as you can imagine, sometimes it's been offered and they were not interested. In some cases, there may be reasons it doesn't make sense for a particular patient. Um, in some cases, we don't know that they already have one because it was put in when they were uh, spending their winter in Florida, 
and our record doesn't have a record of the installation. So there's certainly a number of pitfalls in this type of administrative work, but it's an example of some of the type of work we're doing, not only to be in trials, and, and I should have mentioned, we were one of the sites that participated in that uh, DAPA heart failure trial, um, and so we think it's important to participate in the generation of knowledge, but another factor is how do we implement that for our patients? Another type of treatment that is getting more attention lately with regard to heart failure is that it's been recognized that many people with heart failure have anemia or low hemoglobin or low blood levels. Um, low blood uh, can lead you to be tired or short of breath, which are also often symptoms of heart failure. And so it's long been recognized that these two conditions may go together. And so you might think, well, let's improve the iron levels, which is a, a precursor to building more blood. Um, let's look at the iron levels in these patients. Um, there have been studies of iron pills, which some of you or many of you may have taken. Um, they are often not well tolerated. They can cause uh, nausea, constipation, um, and the amount of iron that gets absorbed is very low. I always tell people, we can give you more in one bag of intravenous iron than you can absorb in three months of taking pills. And so there have been some preliminary studies suggesting that intravenous iron supplementation may be another way to help improve the symptoms of patients with heart failure. And so this is an, an example of another study that we're participating in, a multi-center study of thousands of patients with heart failure um, to identify whether intravenous iron might be another type of medication that's effective for treating uh, heart failure. Another category, as I said, that I wanted to talk about is monitoring. Um, I alluded to the fact that congestion or fluid retention is often one of the uh, most bothersome symptomatic episodes or uh, components of heart failure. Fluid retention can lead to people being tired, short of breath, swelling in their ankles or abdomen, etc. And so one of the things that we're often interested in is how can we monitor people's fluid levels? Um, it can be subtle. We not infrequently have people come in, they're diagnosed with heart failure, and we may remove 20, 30, 40, even 100 pounds of fluid. Now, obviously, people that are carrying 100 pounds of fluid typically know something is wrong, but it's not unusual for us to take out 15 pounds and people to go home shocked at how much fluid they were hiding in their body. Um, this can be hard to assess. I showed you the example of looking at neck veins. They're not always as obvious as in the video I showed. So there's been a lot of interest in technology, particularly with new wearables. Um, for example, um, there have been some use of the Apple Watch to monitor heart rate. Doesn't measure fluid, but I think it's an example of how wearable technology gives us another way to assess uh, people's uh, health status. Within the heart failure space specifically, um, there's a, a device available called CardioMEMS. It's an implantable sensor that gets put in through a vein, either in the neck or the leg, and is left in the veins of the lungs, and it lets us measure the pressure in the lungs, which tends to correlate very closely with people's fluid levels. What's neat about this, it doesn't require a battery, and people who have had this installed lie on a sensor, and every day it transmits readings to us where we can log into a secure web portal and figure out what someone's fluid level is every day. And you might say, well, that's pretty expensive and invasive. What about a scale? Um, anytime that's been tried, um, it clearly has a role, and we still encourage patients to weigh themselves daily. Uh, but in prospective randomized trials, measuring uh, people's fluid level just based on their weight has not been as effective as one might think it is. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. People's muscle mass can change over time. Um, some people like cookies and ice cream more than others. And so, um, especially, I don't know about you guys, but I'm finding myself going to the refrigerator more days <laughs> more than usual these days when I'm uh, home with the pandemic. Um, so I think that highlights the challenges in estimating a weight base, or fluid based just on weight. So this is an example of a waveform that this sensor transmits. Uh, remotely, and so this is a way that we can help monitor patients and help them adjust their medications to ideally keep them out of the hospital and keep people home. So these are just a couple of examples of monitoring technologies. There are also certainly some that are built into defibrillators and pacemakers. Um, those are less novel, and that's why I didn't highlight those today, but that's another method by which um, we're working to try to improve our ability to detect uh, patient problems before they require a visit to the hospital. Another setting or another issue in heart failure is what we call cardiogenic shock, which refers to a shock state where you're in you know, low blood pressure, low blood perfusion to your body, 
um, because your heart's not squeezing enough blood. There's been a lot of developments in the last few years using temporary heart pump technologies, and I have some examples of that on the bottom there, um, of ways that we can support the heart, not just with pills or intravenous medications, but with pumps that interface with the circulation and take over some of the pumping for the heart. Um, one example of this is something called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is essentially a temporary heart-lung machine where the blood's taken out of the body, goes through a, a pump in an artificial lung, and then it's pumped back into the body. It's not unlike when people have surgery and or heart surgery and need to be on a heart-lung machine or a temporary bypass machine, um, but we're using this more frequently these days. In some cases, people that need CPR are treated with this rather than chest compressions. So this has been an area of significant growth. Um, what I'd like to mention is that um, there's another variation on this that you may have heard a little bit about, um, something called veno veno ECMO, where blood is taken out of a vein, given oxygen, and then returned in another vein. In some ways, that's safer than interfacing with an artery because uh, the arterial circulation can lead to strokes. And if you have blockage of arterial circulation, you may not get blood flow and could, for example, be at risk of, of needing a leg amputation. Veno veno ECMO is used to oxygenate blood. And so this is something that's been getting a lot more attention in the COVID era because uh, for patients that are unable to get enough oxygen even on a ventilator, um, this is the next step. And if we can't get enough oxygen into your blood with ECMO, there's nothing more we can do. Um, this is something that has been used even prior to COVID. We use it for people with very severe pneumonia. Um, they sometimes have heart problems as well. Um, there are different configurations of ECMO depending on their status. Uh, but this is something I wanted to highlight as a circulatory support device that was sort of originally invented and used for heart failure that has some application in the uh, ventilatory failure space as well. There's obviously a lot of overlap there. Another um, study that's not heart failure specific, but there's a, a more miniature version of this that removes carbon dioxide from the bloodstream, which can be another way that people's lungs can be failing. That hasn't been as prominent from COVID, but is another way that we can use a machine to take over the effect of the lungs um, and is uh, another study that we're participating in. I wanna give just a brief example here of a, a former patient who had given permission to share his story. It was a 62 year old man, was short of breath, presented to a, an ER at another hospital, collapsed, found to have a massive pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in his lungs, which can be fatal and often is. He was treated with a clot busting medication. He initially stabilized and then deteriorated. He was transferred here and put on this ECMO cardiopulmonary bypass support. Um, Turned out uh, that was essential for him because it took a few hours for our one of our surgeons to finish a heart transplant surgery and then was able to take him to the operating room, remove those clots, and he was off this ECMO in about another day and went home about 10 days later. Um, so this uh, technology and these devices have been another way that we use uh, things that have been learned over the last couple of decades to support people's circulatory system uh, when they have a heart that can't meet the needs of the body. Another area, as I alluded to, was different structural elements. Uh, one thing that can happen when people develop heart failure, their heart may enlarge, and if the heart gets too big, the valve that's designed to cover a hole this size now has to cover this size. It's not big enough, and that valve can leak. And so there have been some studies recently that have looked at uh, the use of something called a mitral clip that goes across the mitral valve, which is in the left ventricle, and can uh, pinch that off so that it's not leaking quite as much. And there have recently been a, a recent study that showed that it decreases rate of heart failure hospitalization and uh, has a low rate of complications from the device. Here's an example of the picture. It's kind of like a little pincher, a little staple that goes across a valve, pinches it together, and then the catheter is removed and the little pinch or clip stays behind. Um, this is something that our interventional cardiology colleagues are able to offer. And is, I think, an example of how when we're treating heart failure, sometimes it's medications, sometimes it's pacemakers, sometimes it's other structural, structural elements. Another um, example of a device, and this is one that I picked partly because we're one of the, the test sites for this, is a device called AccuCinch. And this is sort of like a little cinching mechanism, much like a drawstring on a bag, where we can go in with a catheter and cinch up that area of the heart that's too big 
to reduce the risk of leaking of that valve. Uh, we also have uh, been looking at treatments for the tricuspid valve, which is on the right side of the heart, that in many ways is parallel to the mitral valve. And so there's a number of different devices being tested in this space. And I uh, can see we, we're, we're sharing photos here, although it's inadvertent. Um, this is an example of our tricuspid valve treatment trial team. Um, where we've been testing this versus medical therapy in patients with severe tricuspid valve leaking. Another neat concept that's being studied in heart failure, and this is one that's designed um, arguably more for the what we call preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure, where the heart is stiff and doesn't relax well and may squeeze well. Some of these treatments don't help that as much. This is a way to offload the pressure in the heart. And this is a treatment where we put a small hole in the heart on purpose. Uh, and this is a way it works at almost like a pop-off valve. And there's a couple different uh, versions of this in clinical trials. And this is another thing that we're testing to see if we can't help people with heart failure um, have fewer symptoms. I want to talk a little bit about uh, heart transplant and LVADs. This is something that's uh, a niche for a relatively small fraction of people who have heart failure. Uh, but it's becoming more common and uh, certainly uh, available to uh, more patients than it used to be. Um, one example is, and this is, I want to show you a video here. Um, typically, when we do a heart transplant um, and someone has given this generous gift of a heart or their family has consented on their behalf, um, it is transported in a cooler. And it is not too dissimilar from the Coleman cooler that you can buy at uh, Target or Walmart, for that matter. And um, as you might imagine, putting the heart on ice in the cooler, um, it works, but we have a very short window where the heart will be able to reanimate or be resuscitated successfully and work well. And so there's been a lot of work in what's called don't, um, ex vivo perfusion, which is Latin for outside the body, but uh, implies living. And here's an example here, if I can, hopefully I can make this slide work. I think if you just advance the slide. Can I do it? Okay, there we go. Thank you. So this is an example of a heart that is on this perfusion device where we take a liter of the donor's blood, hook it up to this machine. It's covered with sterile saran wrap, essentially. And we're able to keep the heart pumping and can have it outside the body for up to about eight hours instead of four hours. So this is a trial that we're very proud to be participating in. We're, to my understanding, excuse me, I just knocked the microphone there. Um, we are the only non-sort of large academic university-based uh, center that's involved in this trial, um, and we've been very excited about preliminary results in that it offers us an opportunity to uh, use hearts that come from farther away. Um, this is also notable in that uh, there are two categories of organ donors. There's donors who have died brain death, and historically those have been the only donors that have been used for heart transplant where someone has a catastrophic neurologic injury, often a stroke, it could be a head injury, um, where they are dead on the basis of their, they have irreversible and complete loss of brain function, um, the heart is then able to be procured where it's beating until we stop it and, and retrieve it for transplant. Um, there's another category called donation after cardiac death, where someone may not meet brain death criteria, but otherwise has a very abysmal prognosis and may intend to be an organ donor. Um, what's done then is to permit a cardiac death where they die on the basis of their heart stopping. Um, people have been doing transplants of lungs, livers, kidneys, uh, I believe pancreas as well, of donation after cardiac death donors. But as you can imagine, um, we in the heart transplant community have been less eager to use hearts that were allowed to stop before we are able to retrieve them for transplant. What's different now is with this technology, and this is a study that we're gearing up to participate in. It's trials ready and has started nationally. And some of the final logistics uh, were delayed by the COVID pandemic. This is a way where the donor's heart can be allowed to stop. There's typically a five minute or so hands off period to confirm that the, any residual brain function would have progressed to final brain death. The heart is then retrieved and can be put on this machine that lets us resuscitate the heart with, without any chance of resuscitating the donor in a sense. Um, so this has been used in Australia and the United Kingdom with very good results. And so this technology is not only extending the time which we can go to retrieve organs, it's extending the number of organs that we can use. 
Another category is donors with hepatitis C. Historically, uh, because hepatitis C, which affects the liver and can cause liver cancer or cirrhosis, is something that we sure we don't want to give to people and it was not curable. Now with uh, current uh, medications available to treat this condition, hepatitis C is in 99% of instances a curable, treatable disease. And so we are now open to and have been accepting hearts from donors that have hepatitis C, which we then treat for that and it can cure it down the road. These couple of strategies have allowed us to increase the donor pool. Uh, depending on where you, where you look and what statistics you look at, probably in the 20 to 25% range. So there's, we've moved from about 2,000 to about 2,500 heart transplants in, in the United States every year. Um, we think that these technologies have the potential to increase that even further. Um, the next thing I want to just mention briefly is that the outcomes with uh, heart pumps or LVADs, um, Dick Cheney and Rod Carew are probably the two most famous uh, LVAD recipients, many of you may have heard of. Um, the outcomes continue to improve. And, this is another uh, curve that higher is better. And so um, if you, the, the blue line went straight across, that would mean no one had either died or had a clot or a, in their pump or a catastrophic stroke. Um, you can see the, the red line was the pump we were using a few years ago. The blue, one, blue line is an example of one of the currently available pumps. And you can see almost 80% survival in two years. Um, and if you think back to the slide where I talked about people with um, heart failure who are on no medications have a one in uh, three chance of uh, surviving, or of, excuse me, of dying in the uh, first two years, down to one in 10 with uh, medications. Um, these are people that have a, uh, you know, essentially a one in five chance of dying at two years, and these are the sick patients, so it's not entirely comparable. Um, so these outcomes continue to improve as well. So I think what we've seen is that there's really been a lot of changes in the heart failure space over the last couple of years, uh, both from medications, from other uh, technologies and devices for monitoring, for altering the structure of the heart in a way that may help it uh, pump more effectively, and for some of the, what I often tell patients, well, you know, a transplant or an LVAD is almost never plan A, uh, but it's nice that we have our plan F and plan G. Uh, those are becoming easier and safer to use as well. So uh, I'd certainly uh, be grateful to take any questions and appreciate you taking time um, out of your day to listen in today. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ekman. That was a great presentation. And like you said, at this point, we're going to open it up to Q&A. And Dr. Ekman, if you could just advance the slide one more. There's a, uh, a walkthrough here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to open up Q&A. To access the Q&A pod, please uh, drag your cursor to the bottom of your Zoom screen which will pop up a control bar. And please click on the icon that says Q&A. Um, and at this point, it looks like we have a couple questions in the pod. Uh, and the first question is, how can people stay up to date with heart failure research? That's a great question. Uh, if for those of you who may not have heard, how can people stay up to date with heart failure research? I think there's a number of resources um, you know, and professional organizations, the Heart Failure Society of America, hfsa.org is one organization to follow. Uh, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology are some others that are broadly looking not just at heart failure research, but um, a number of topics. Um, certainly it's something you can ask your doctor about, and, and we would expect that they would be up to speed on these sorts of things. Um, and then there are also um, opportunities to visit with heart failure specialists. Uh, for example, I sometimes will see um, one of Dr. Schottke's patients that I may visit with once or very sporadically just to check in on what studies are available. Um, people can also uh, reach out to uh, professional organizations or, or institutions to ask what studies might be available if they're looking for things that if they're particularly or personally interested in, in research opportunities. Great, thank you for that. So this attendee writes, if I have heart failure, should I be started on the new diabetes drug? Uh, question, if you have heart failure, should you be started on the new diabetes drug? Um, without knowing your specific medical details, it's hard to uh, give a, an answer to that that applies for everyone. There are some people for whom it's not safe. Probably the, the biggest category is if you have severe kidney problems. Um, and the other is that it can increase risk of, of bladder infections and yeast infections. And there's a very small increased incidence uh, on the order of a couple per thousand of uh, amputations, for example. That being said, 
These drugs are uh, generally very safe. They have a very favorable side effect profile. Um, I've been using them in my practice for several months now and now have dozens of patients on these medications. Um, and I've been uh, impressed at how well tolerated they are. Um, honestly, one of the biggest factors and problems has been what I like to call their financial toxicity is that um, in contrast to some of these older medications, they do, um, for many people, tend to be uh, quite expensive, although we, we do work hard to try to mitigate that and work closely with our pharmacy colleagues. But I would say if you have a low ejection fraction and do not have severe kidney problems, um, many people should be started on these medications. And it, it will be in the guidelines and sort of the professional society recommendations in the very near future, which we hope will also help prompt uh, better insurance coverage of these medications. So I would encourage people to ask their doctors if you know, I feel like a commercial here. Ask now if this is right for you. But I think there's a lot of truth to that, and there are very few reasons why this shouldn't at least be considered. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, Follow-up question is, can you compare the new diabetes drug to the new heart failure drug, Entresto? Great question. So Entresto, or Secubitril Belsartan, um, is a, probably the other um, major drug uh, that was uh, presented or published about five years ago. Um, this is another class of medication that has really made a big difference in terms of heart failure management. Um, they have different mechanisms. The Secubitril Valsartan works on, to some degree, blood pressure and some of the hormones your kidneys make, whereas the diabetes drugs work more on glucose or sugar metabolism. Um, we don't have compelling data on, um, you know, what if you, if you had to pick which one should use one or the other. Um, the benefits appear to be additive, and some fraction of the patients that were in the diabetes drug trial were on Entresto, uh, but both have been shown to reduce the risks of hospitalization, death from heart failure, um, and so I think both are uh, potentially very important uh, tools in the armamentarium of treating heart failure. Thank you very much. Uh, this attendee writes, is heart, is heart failure ever caused by other conditions? Uh, they say that they've heard that it could be linked to some kind of cancer treatment. That's a great question. Heart failure is, has, I, I could probably think of 30 or 40 things that can cause it. Um, cancer treatment is a pretty common cause. Some of the medications in particular, adriamycin, which is a mainstay of treatment of uh, many breast cancers, many lymphomas and hematologic malignancies like leukemia. Um, although I would say lymphoma and breast cancer are the more common causes. Many of the antibodies that are used to treat different cancers um, also have been shown to cross-react with the heart and can cause heart problems. We, um, as do many other practices, have uh, what we think of as a cardio-oncology clinic where we partner with oncologists uh, both to monitor people who are receiving chemotherapy that may be toxic to the heart as well as to treat them if they develop heart complications from their cancer medications. Other medical conditions that can affect the heart uh, I would say a common one can be substance use. Alcohol is the most common, but methamphetamines are another substance that can be directly toxic to the heart. Um, those are probably the biggest ones. And then uh, the risk factors for heart disease in general, which often include high blood pressure and diabetes, um, are some of the biggest risk factors for developing heart failure. In some cases, it's bad luck. It runs in the family. Um, it's from a viral infection, and, and I will note that there clearly have been some case reports that COVID can attack the heart and directly cause heart failure. It is not only causing lung problems. Um, so that's another mechanism by which the heart can be damaged. Thank you very much for that. Um, so this attendee writes, does heart failure affect young people and what would cause that? Uh, the question about whether heart failure affects young people, it clearly does, although it's less common. The incidence of heart failure goes up pretty substantially as we get older. Um, in younger patients, it is often a, a genetic problem where, for example, there are a, num a number of proteins that go into uh, making uh, the proteins of the heart that cause it to squeeze, tighten, myosin, uh, blanking on myoglobin, a number of these proteins. If there is a, a genetic abnormality or mutation such that the body uh, makes those proteins wrong, it doesn't work normally. Muscular dystrophy, um, which is a skeletal muscle, muscle problem, can also affect the muscle of the heart. So those are common. I would say um, substance abuse is a big one. It's, you know, we don't go more than a week or two without seeing someone who's been using methamphetamines as a cause of heart failure, even in someone who's young. 
Um, and sometimes it's a consequence of congenital heart disease. People are born with um, various problems with valves or the chambers of their heart, and they may develop heart failure younger than they would have otherwise. Um, and in some cases, it, we don't know. Uh, people develop it, and we may do genetic testing and not find anything. Um, in other cases, we assume it's a viral infection, but we never know for sure. Um, but it, it clearly can happen in young patients as well. Thank you very much. Uh, this attendee is just wondering about other methods, other than the ones that you mentioned, to monitor their fluid retention. That's a great question about monitoring fluid retention. Um, you know, again, one of the easy ones that we still encourage people to use is the scale. You know, step on the scale every morning. Um, there are um, there have been some other methods using uh, what's called impedance of uh, devices like pacemakers that measure from the battery or the can, as we call it, to the tip of the wire that measure the fluid levels. And by um, estimating the, how much electrical signal goes across the lung, the idea being if you have a, a more fluid in your lung, the electrical signal is transmitted differently. And so many pacemakers and defibrillators, uh, or I should say some, have that built in or that capability built in. Um, there are also um, some other <coughs> similar technologies to the uh, implantable pulmonary artery sensor that are being developed to look at this. Uh, there's another one that was uh, by an Israeli company uh, called uh, Sensible Medical Systems. We were part of the trial where people would put on a vest that they would wear uh, for about 90 seconds a day, and that would directly estimate the lung fluid volumes using a type of radar technology. Um, so that's another one. Um, you know, a, a number of other things are thought to potentially be surrogates that can be measured with uh, pacemakers or defibrillators, heart rate variability. Um, you can use those to measure how active people are um, because they have some degree of mobility sensors. And if someone is less active, you could surmise that they may be holding on to more fluid. So there's a number of different methods. And you know, I would say that this is one of the, the broad truisms in uh, across medicine is that assessing someone's fluid status or volume status is one of the most challenging things we do in medicine. It leads to a lot of arguments in the hallway about whether you think someone <laughs> needs more fluids or less fluids. Scott's laughing. I must be on to something here. Um, and we often don't get it right. Um, and that's part of why there's a lot of interest in these monitoring technologies. Um, we also, um, there's a way to uh, estimate your plasma volume uh, by using a radio-labeled uh, iodine. Um, that was the, the Daxor is a company I mentioned that makes this technology that lets us really estimate your plasma volume based on how fast the, this protein leaves your bloodstream, um, we can put in a catheter. If you go through, you know, have people lay down like in that uh, statue I showed or the sculpture and can put a catheter in through their vein and measure the pressures in their heart, which often correlate with fluid status as well. Obviously, we can't have people do that at home. Uh, but there's a lot of technologies to try to estimate uh, people's fluid levels. Thank you very much. Uh, so this attendee writes, Dr. Ekman, is there any data regarding LVADs and heart failure in regards to the current COVID-19 pandemic? The question is about LVADs and uh, in the COVID era. Um, so there have not been any um, reports that I've seen of um, you know, a, a large series of patients with uh, getting an LVAD after a COVID infection or as a consequence of it. LVADs are still being installed. Uh, we put one in just about a week ago and did, I think, six or seven of them in April. Um, and so this is typically done for people with sufficiently severe heart failure that they can't wait. Um, so they clearly are still being installed. Um, if somebody came in with a severe COVID infection and had both heart and lung failure, we would be at least reluctant to put in an LVAD um, until we were pretty confident that their lung disease was going to get better. And if the heart was sick because of COVID, Often temporary support will be enough that if we're just patient, the heart will get better on its own. So it, they're still being used in the COVID era, uh, but there's fewer reports on using them specifically to treat the heart manifestations of COVID. If someone has a COVID-associated uh, heart failure or heart rhythm problems, we would typically reach for something like ECMO or one of the temporary support modalities in the short term instead. Thank you very much. Um, so this attendee writes that uh, her aunt has acute heart failure and she's 93 years old. Are all of these therapy options available for her? Uh, great question. Uh, for someone who's 93, I think we'd be pretty reluctant to offer an LVAD. And transplants are, are rarely offered over the age of 70. And it's not some, something that we have anything against people in their 70s. 
uh, more that their risk of dying from competing causes, cancer, Alzheimer's, et cetera, is starting to get high enough that we're not sure that the risk is worth it. Uh, but for someone who is uh, 93, in fact, I just got a, a letter in the mail yesterday from one of my patients who's 94. It was his daughter sending me pictures of him up on a ladder cleaning out the gutters. She was suitably horrified as well. But showing how <laughs> active he is, and, and our intent is to help people keep people um, as active as possible. Um, most of the medications that we use are still appropriate for people, um, even if they are older. Um, some of the valve technologies um, are, are have actually been pioneered in older patients. Um, and the, the technology of the hole in the heart is also something that would potentially be suitable for, for older patients. Um, so I, I would say that we still are interested in treating people even as they get older. And in fact, I know my panel of patients are um, highly enriched with people over the age of 60. And, and certainly, you know, even I think 15% of my patients are over the age of 80. Um, so uh, we're, we're definitely willing to and in many cases, able to offer these treatments even to people in their 90s. Thank you very much. And it looks like we have uh, time for just a few more questions. Um, so the next one would be, are heart failure patients at any greater risk of uh, con contracting COVID-19? And also, uh, would they have a more challenging experience with COVID-19? That's a great question. Uh, it's not clear um, in terms of the risk of contracting it. I think we're still learning a, a, a a lot about the transmission and the risk factors, um, but it is clear, or it appears to be clear from retrospective analysis, that of the people that have it and have it severely enough to be in the hospital, that uh, cardiovascular problems, whether it's again hypertension, diabetes, um, or heart failure, um, appear to be more common in the people that are quite sick from COVID. So it does appear to be clear that people who acquire it, who have heart failure, may be at increased risk of problems and increased risk of dying from it. Um, we, the guidance we've typically given to our patients um, is, you know, to emphasize the using masks and, and doing their best to, you know, minimize contact with others. Um, but it's not something that we can clearly say that having heart failure makes you more likely to get it. But it does seem that if you get it and have heart failure, you may be at increased risk of a, a poor outcome. Thank you very much for that. I think this is a good question to end off on. And that would be, uh, what makes you most hopeful for heart failure patients? That's a great question. I think what makes me most hopeful is, um, and when I think back to, you know, as I went through medical school and my training and was sort of faced with the decision of, of what to, to focus on and what to specialize in, um, I, I think in some ways the fact that heart failure is so common um, uh, is hopeful. It gives me hope in the sense that there's a lot of energy and a lot of attention and a lot of interest being directed to improving the quality of life for people with heart failure and, and helping them live longer. Um, what, what's been amazing for me to see in the um, almost 20 years since I've graduated from medical school is the number of treatments that are available. And I think back to people that I treated even in my training that we didn't have anything to help them and now we do. Um, some of the transcatheter valve therapies, the, the, for the aortic valve for example, that didn't exist when I was in training, and, and I'm not that old. I'm, I'm almost at the point where I need bifocals. Um, but the fact that we've got a, a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and interest, not just locally, but nationally and internationally, in heart failure uh, research and development of new technologies, new treatments, and better ways, I think, to get the treatments we know about to the patients that have it, um, I, I think that the future is, is bright and that we're, we're learning a lot and that by virtue of this being a common disease, there's a lot of interest and energy into um, improving the care of patients in the future. Well, thank you very much for that, Dr. Ackman. Um, at this point, is there any final words that you'd like to say? I guess I'd like to again thank people for joining us today and uh, thank uh, Chris and Scott for the invitation to speak and hope that people found this uh, interesting and valuable at Heart Failure. We'd of course be happy to take uh, more individual personal questions or see anyone uh, clinically if people have other questions they'd like to cover. Turn it back over to you, Chris. So I'll just echo what Dr. Ekman said. Thank you so much for making the time to join us this afternoon. And we will be doing this again next Tuesday, um, looking more at electrophysiology, if that's of interest to you. I hope you will join us. But want to make sure you know several ways to stay connected with us. We are on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, so many ways to stay connected. 
And again, we so appreciate the support of our community members. And if that's something you are interested in looking into, please do check out our website and learn more about the work that you can help us move forward. Thanks again for choosing to spend time with us today.